Part 1b, Adam Cadman. We have now followed Kabbalistical reasoning as it attempted to plot the formation of the cosmos and its forces from a point beyond even the exterior of the head of God in which our cosmos is only a dream. As we zoom in toward the depiction of the head of God, we enter the realm of the glowing gloom, the bright darkness, the false light, etc., wherein our cosmic creation began being brought into being. As God's singular ray of thought emanated downward toward the core of his consciousness, outward rippling flow, piercing downward to discover the source of its perturbations from an absolutely calm, still, zero energy field, it shattered these original vessels in four places, forming the division of the cosmos into the four elemental forces, or four hakabalistic worlds. Each of these worlds formed into its own cosmos. In hakabalistic world of Isaiah, the lowest and centralmost realm, there were ten ripples emanating from the utmost central core world, which was called Malkuth, meaning the kingdom. The three supernal sephirot of these ten did not expand and remain as ethereal levels, invisible within our own physical cosmos, but present in the form of the effect of our consciousness resulting from them as cause. The lower seven sephirot of the ripples in Isaiah expanded into the six cardinal directions and the inner direction of the passage of time. These formed the dimensions of the cosmos surrounding Malkuth, the kingdom. The four dimensions, the three doubled into six cardinal directions, plus the fourth direction of the forward motion of time, and the four elemental forces, fusion or earth, electromagnetism or air, fission or fire, and gravity or water, are reflections in the lower realm of Isaiah, the cosmos of Malkuth, of Hakabalistic concept of the four worlds, Isaiah, Bariah, Yetzirah, and Atzaluth, the four-letter tetragrammaton name of God symbolizes all these thought models and is shown here anthropomorphically depicting a man's anatomy as having two legs, final he, two arms, he, and a head, yod, around a single torso, vav. This anthropomorphism of the tetragrammaton is also the first formation of God inside the cosmos around Malkuth in the form of Adam Kadmon, meaning the cosmic man. In his depiction of Gnostic concepts studied in Takuni Zohar, Eliphas Levy, 19th century French Kabbalist, shows us the first stage of coming into being of Adam Kadmon, wherein God, as the waters above, perceives himself as darkness on the face of the deep, in the cosmos as the waters below. His image appears distorted from its own point of view inside the mirror below God because of the disruption from stillness by God's breath moving like the wind on the air above the deep, causing the first ripples to begin emanating from Malkuth, the kingdom, deep within the mind of God. Thus, the demiurge, devil, Satan, or anti-God first appears as the reflection of God in the disquieted waters of the lesser light in the cosmos below. Next, as shown in this drawing also by Levy, God figuratively lowers himself into the cosmos of Isaiah, surrounding Malkuth, to become Adam Cadman, 
or the cosmic template upon which the bodily image and likeness of man were based. God descends into the cosmos of Isaiah, it is written, in search of Shekinah, his female counterpart, called variously the Presence, the Bride of God, and Sophia, meaning feminine wisdom as the first emanation following forth from the crown of the Godhead. As God descends, the cosmos of Isaiah expands due to the displacement of fluid energy by the gravity of his mass. Thus, the God manifest within the cosmos of Isaiah appears from the point of view below him as the devil. In this final depiction by Levi, we see that by the time God, as Adam Cadman, has lowered himself down to the level of Malkuth, the kingdom at the center deep within the entirety of his mind, to where he can walk among man, he assumes the form of both Christ and Antichrist combined. Thus the crown of awareness is made of the thorns of other people's minds inside a psychic network called Christ Consciousness combining into any one person's mind the entire potential capacity for intellect of all mankind. Hence, Christ's title as Son of Man, Son of God, as well as his being the mind of God, but also God's only incarnate Son. In this 17th century printing, by Christian Kabbalist Athenaeus Kircher, we see the triune halo representing God in the form of the Christian Trinity concept atop the wheels of concepts emanating outward from a core symbolizing the cosmos of the Kabbalistic world of Isaiah. Here we see Adam Cadman, the cosmic template of man's physical body, and the mind of God that can possess any living person, depicted as a childlike Christ, whose limbs reach across the cosmos of Isaiah, and who is yet bounded within the outer three realms of the other Kabbalistic worlds. Here we see the outer edge of the cosmos of Isaiah, to which the reach of the childlike Adam Cadman extends, is marked by the wheel of the zodiac, and that the microcosmos within the young Christ's reach is comprised of the seven planetary orbits, symbolizing the six cardinal directions plus the forward motion of time. Below these are three worlds surrounding Malkuth, the kingdom, which signify the three essential elements of alchemy, salt, sulfur, and mercury, signifying, alike frozen, fluid, or vapid, the conditional states of matter as symbolic of the three spatial dimensions. Malkuth, at the center of which are Adam Cadman's genitals, is shown in black. Beneath the feet of Adam Cadman, in the three upper worlds of a Kabbalistic four worlds are three groups of three aspects. These signify the seven heavens and seven archangels of Bariah, the twelve permutations of the three tetragrammatons, names of God, of Yetzirah, and the three layers of the greater light, Ayin, Ayin Sof, and Ayan Sof Or of Atsaluth, the uppermost world. In this depiction, we see the zodiac circle as surrounding Adam Cadman as alike an Ouroboros or Aura, signifying the realm beyond God when God is lowered into a form of body in the cosmos of Isaiah. The origin of attributing the twelve signs of the zodiac to Shekinah, the presence or bride of God, 
begins with the Chinese application of the meridians, which we will discuss in the section on the East, to the twelve signs of the zodiac by astrologers following Marco Polo's explorations of the Orient. Applying the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac to the twelve meridians of Chinese Taoism originated in the Orient, but was not brought back into Europe until the early era of the Dark Ages during the First Crusade. The practice of astrology, like also mathematic, geomancy, alchemy, etc., was made illegal across most of Europe during the Dark Ages, and this manuscript, comparing the wheel of the zodiac around the edge of the page to the organs inside an autopsied cadaver, represents the height of scientific blasphemy committed in the face of the Church of Christ by radical rationalist Kabbalists. However, this knowledge proved to not be isolated to those in contiguous Eurasia, as we see in this diagram from the Mixtec Cherokee regions of southern North America and northern Mesoamerica, the association of human bodily parts and organs to aspects of the calendar was not confined to only one continent. The animal head symbols surrounding the naked body in this depiction symbolize the 18 months of the lunar calendar the date back to that originally developed by the southern Mesoamerican Maya. So we see now that Adam Cadman, symbolizing the cosmic template of man in the form of a Kabbalistic body of God as a form of cosmic atlas, holding, instead of only our own world on his back, the balance of the elemental forces in the cosmos of Isaiah. Just as below, at the level of the veil of the temple, are the seven Olympic gods, called now by their Roman names, identified with the seven visible planets, so above, at the level of the veil of the abyss, are the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac. Just as Adam Cadman, the body of God as a Kabbalah, represents the Abba, or Father Principle of Cosmic Generation, so does Shekinah, or the Bride of God, represent Ima, the equal mother principle counterpart. So we see now the Shekinah, symbolizing the astrological influence on man by the zodiac, and the motive Olympic planets, as an inner border of the cosmos of Bariah, holding within herself not the seven planets alone, but also in her upright anatomy, the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac, expressed from Aries above her head through Pisces beneath her feet. Her anatomy as a series of astrological signs in the Babylonian zodiac thus identifies the zodiacal Shekinah, or Bride of God, with the Egyptian concept of Nuit, the female emptiness of deep space. Thus, to see again the simple circle of the astrological zodiac signs, we are looking at the anatomy of the upright Shekinah, as well as within her vesica symbol for the female womb as a symbol in turn for the vacuum of the void. Here we see how the seven planets are assigned as rulers, dignitaries, or Olympic gods over the twelve Babylonian zodiac signs. The upper five regular planets are oriented as horizontal bars across the face of the flat twelve sign zodiac circle, and the final two classical Olympic planetary gods of antiquity, the sun and moon, rule over the final two signs of the zodiac. Thus, each planet rules over a pair of zodiac signs, but the sun and moon only rule over one each. Hence, the seven Olympic dignitaries of the seven visible planets rule within the zodiac circle in a Kabbalistic study of astrology. 
This pattern of the seven planets ruling over the twelve signs was known even by the Gnostics two thousand years before I speak these words, although not by their profane Greco-Roman titles as Olympic gods. They were called by the Gnostics the twelve aeons, each ruled by one archon or authority, and these were said to be endowed with the power or right to rule by seven powers. The twelve archons include the souls of Cain and Abel, first sons of Adam and Eve, as well as Belus, meaning liar, and Sabaoth, meaning blind, later Essene and Gnostic terms for Satan as the Demiurge. The key to finding how the powers ruled between the twelve authorities in the Gnostic hypostasis of the Archon's myth from two thousand years ago is in the calibration of the inner seven to the outer twelve. The Gnostics, including the historical person upon whom the fictional narratives called the Canon Gospels based their character of Jesus, were, by the Romans occupying Judea, compelled to conceal their knowledge of such esoteric systems of wisdom, and the result was the Christian establishment of seven different regional churches dedicated to the twelve apostles or traveling disciple students of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, even though the pattern of their relationships became a concealment rather than revelation of their true wisdom, the early Christian church fathers recognized that the seven churches were only foundations establishing the seven powers of the seven Olympic gods from the seven visible planets on earth for the twelve apostles, who themselves were only embodiments symbolic of the twelve archons, who each ruled over one aeon or duration of two thousand years on the calendar of solar procession. All this sounds esoteric today, but was common knowledge to all mankind once. After the Gnostics concealed the calendar of solar procession of twelve aeons as the twelve archons over each and their seven powers between them, and then the Christians further obfuscated these by assembling seven churches under twelve apostles, by the time of the Middle Dark Ages, when Francis Barrett described these seven rulers of the twelve zodiac signs of astrology by the seven sigils of the seven archangels who ruled over the seven days of the standard week. Although the use of such sigils was common in Dark Age grimoires, or books of magic, the code word for science at that time, these seven may have a much older origin than Dark Ages Europe. In these pages from early 20th century Kabbalah scholar Sir E. A. Wallace Budge, we see his reproductions of these same seven sigils apparently present as written inside of seven talismans, which originated in pre-Athenian Greece, Attica, and the surrounding Mediterranean islands. These seven talismans signify the seven camia of the Olympic gods of the visible planets. These seven camia, talismanic figures, are even older than the other figures for each depicted alongside them here by Budge. The figure on the left of each row is the pattern of the Hebrew Gematria number square of a certain number of cells associated with each of the seven planets. The figures to the right of these leftmost characters, labeled as the planets, are the spirit sigil, the demon sigil, and the cameo position in the zodiac. These positions in the zodiac show the sigils given by Barrett for the daily archangels positioned within the seven talismanic figures of the seven Olympic cameo. These seven cameo were known and shown within Dark Age grimoires as relating to the seven archangel sigils as well. However, what makes their relationship clear is having originated long before this in pre-Golden Age Greece, 
is as symbolizing the seven planetary amulet patterns of the Hebrew Gematria number squares. These date back to the golden era of Greece contemporary to the later Babylonian captivity and repopulation by the earliest diaspora Hebrews to return from Babylonian slavery toward Palestine. Therefore, it is more than likely the related talismanic figures of the seven Kamiya and seven sigils of the archangels date from at least as late as this era as well, and originated in Greece as much as the Hebrew Gematria number square amulets originated in Babylon and Palestine. The implication of these amulets and talismans is that the knowledge of the seven Kamiya and seven archangel sigils extends back prehistorically beyond even the Gnostics of 2,000 years ago. When we depict the same pattern as that which we can derive by astrology as the seven planets ruling over the twelve zodiac signs using the sigils of the archangels in red and the Kamiya talismanic figures in green, we find the same pattern can be formed from the latter as the former, and the latter preceded the former by no fewer than 500 years. Of course, when we subtract all these ancient forms of symbolism from the simplest format to modern understanding of this system, using the seven visible planets as rulers between the twelve zodiac signs of modern astrology, we can understand the truth behind all the intervening aeons of obfuscation by the various religious faiths of the eras. First, around 500 BC, the seven Kamiya talismans and the seven archangel sigils became the seven number squares, amulets, and the twelve aeons. By the time of the events described in the Gospels, the Gnostics, including the real Jesus himself, understood these same concepts as the seven powers of twelve archons, and now we can sum them all up simply by the shorthand symbols for the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac and the seven Olympic planets by simple application of astrology. Let us turn our attention now to studying the Gnostic models from two thousand years before now to better understand the nature of the soul as it existed according to the students of Kabbalah during the era of the New Testament. We see here again an epitome of the Gnostic mythos described in the hypostasis of the archons, meaning the origin of our authority, or more precisely, the source of our right to rule. We see some names familiar to us from our studies of Torah and its related Apocrypha. However, other names appear unique to this myth and do not recur in any of the other documents describing Gnostic beliefs, even from the same era. This implies that the presence descends from first a realm of seven Kamiya talismans and seven archangel sigils at Saluth to next a realm of seven Gematria number squares and twelve aeons, yet Syrah, to a realm of seven powers and twelve archons, Bariah, before being expressed in the modern terms of astrology, Asaya, the seven planets and twelve signs. The reason the Gnostics of his era continued to err by substituting the twelve archons and their seven powers for the twelve aeons and seven number squares, rather than skipping ahead to our own format of astrological application, as he would have predicted, and thus causing the intervention of Christianity's seven churches under twelve apostles, is no mistake on the part of the historical person of Jesus called the Christ. As we shall see next, Gnostic Christian Pseudepigrapha, New Testament Gospels era Apocrypha, records Jesus Christ as de describing a very complex form of Hakabalah. However, nevertheless, the Gnostics passed on their twelve archons over seven powers as the twelve apostles over seven churches as a simple system based on the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac 
and the seven visible planets, when in fact nowhere did Christ describe anything of the sort in any of the writings recording his spoken words. Thus, by the time of modern application to this system of twelve star signs and seven planetary rulers, of the practice of assigning Hebrew and Greek letters to these as well, which could not have originated before modern Hebrew and Greek alphabets replaced Aramaic and Coptic around 2,000 years ago, we have before our eyes now a system that shows a seven-point heptagram within a circle divided into 12 sections. Each of the 12 sections of the divided circle have a letter pair in green, signifying consonants from the Greek alphabet and a letter from the Hebrew alphabet in blue, in addition to a sign from the Babylonian zodiac in red, and each of the seven sections of the divided heptagram within the circle have one of the seven Greek vowels, green, and a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, blue, in addition to the seven visible planetary glyphs, red. In the next section on Christian Gnostic concepts taught by Jesus himself, According to the New Testament era pseudepigrapha, we will address why we see the heptagram within the circular motif symbolizing the seven churches and twelve apostles, rather than, as we should see, the motif of the five horizontal and three vertical divisions between the seven planets ruling within the twelve zodiac sign circle. The heptagram model has been used by Christians from the time of St. John of Patmos through the life of early 16th century Kabbalist John D., who expressed it as the Sigillum Dei Meth, to the early 20th century Kabbalist Aleister Crowley, who called it the Star of Babylon. This motif, with the labels of the seven Greek vowels in green, seven planetary metals and seven oriental chakras in black, the seven planets in red, and seven Hebrew letters in blue, as upon five horizontal and two vertical divisions inside a circle with the labels of Greek, green, signs of the zodiac, red, and Hebrew, blue, we will not return to again. However, this model, with the calibration corrected to year zero, being at the exact nadir of the zodiac circle of aeons in solar precession, should not be underestimated in importance when considering this model was that known to Pythagoras.